Welcome, everybody. Thanks for jumping on and making us a part of your late morning or early afternoon, whichever way you slice the pie here in the U.S. So thanks for jumping on. I'm going to jump through some housekeeping items first, and then I'm going to make some introductions to our friends on video, if that's fair for everybody. So number one, this is a conversation. I promise this is not death by PowerPoint. Thank goodness. Um, we've sat through enough presentations where you've been read to, and we're all adults, so welcome to the conversation, needless to say. Um, we do want you guys to chat questions, and we will do our extreme best to try to figure out what and which questions are being asked at the appropriate time, and I will try to throw those out to the panelists that we have uh, on video today. So without further ado, please do that. And then those questions that we can't get to, I will try to come back to those at the very end, if that's fair for everybody. So what I will do is I will uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Jonathan Phillipson. People call me JP for that don't know me, but uh, I support the sales channel here at Green Cloud, just, just by way of introduction. So the channel managers and our partner recruitment teams roll up to me here at Green Cloud, and trust me, I am, uh, I'm not the smartest one on, on this, this video chat today. I brought three other guys to assist me with the Q&A, so that's the good news, and have, have solitude in that, needless to say. So at the top of the stack, I'm gonna make some introductions. Matt Lee, one of my favorite dudes in the community, in the IT channel. Matt Lee is the director of not only technology, but security for Iconic. Iconic IT is one of our awesome partners, and they have offices in Kansas, in Texas, in Colorado, and it's as far north as Connecticut and New York. So welcome, Matt. Appreciate you jumping on here. And then we also have Steve Sims. Steve is our CISO here at Green Cloud, and he has over 18 years of security experience. And Justin Fox is also on the line with us as well, and Justin runs our product and systems development teams here at Green Cloud. So glad to have everybody. So our goal today is really take a closer look at what good looks like, right? And we can see it through the eyes of a client, a managed services company, even our internal products, and how we as a company take a look at security as a whole. So without further ado, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see all the individuals here on the uh, on the screen on the video welcome guys welcome to the conversation so for starters how about we do this let's just start at the top and that's why we're here let's take a look at what good looks like right so that's that's why we're here that's what we wanted to, to discuss today and so let's keep the conversation so matt let's start with you if, if i had asked you from a security posture standpoint what does good look like? How would you answer that? And then let's kind of ping pong that around a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm going to be succinct here. And I'm, I'm known for very short answers in general. Uh, if anybody's <laughs> never heard me before, I can tell that lie. Uh, I would say that the, the best way to define a good security practice is iterative. It better not look the same tomorrow as it did yesterday. Right. And, and I think what that shows, if you boil it down, is really just the active practice of due care. Right, do care in our industry is kind of defined as this reasonable person rule. I say person rule and not, not reasonable man rule as it's written in the book, this is personal choice. But the reasonable person rule that just says, hey, did that person do the right things and the things they should be doing to meet the, the threat and the adversary? And so ultimately, what does good look like? It looks like doing something else over and over again to close new holes as you find them, as they're developed and as things go forward. And it's just the practice of, of being iterative, uh, you know, is, is my, my poke at that, you know, Jonathan. And so, uh, especially if you can show those iterations, if you can show the improvement, if you can show that, you know, last year I did this, but this year I do this, 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 and this. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the things where there's a really tall wall in front of us. And, and I don't think people realize that, that, that we got to get over it quick, right? And, and, and I think that's kind of one of the challenges right now. So. That's my answer. That's my so what, you, so what you're saying is set it and forget it is a concept of the past, correct? The Ronco steamer is not how we do security. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. So do you, do you find yourself as a managed services company, do you have a hard time having that conversation with an end user? How does the conversation flow? What pushbacks do you get? I think, you know, that's a great question. I think it's, it's scoped. 
to that end user. But I think the challenge though is that it's really more endemic in our own selves, right? At the end of the day. I mean, I think the end user conversation is ill-equipped to succeed because we don't fully believe and understand our, our challenge, right? And I, I think even as I just had a, a perfect example in my organization, we set out a new work from home kind of continuance guidance to our people. And there's not a mention of maintaining a, a safe workspace from a security perspective. We talk about all the others, my ankle doesn't need to hurt, I better be standing, don't drink. I don't know who that one's aimed at, but the point being, is that there's those two, not right? It's not, not JP and Matt, no. But you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the point is, is that we don't even have it as part of our daily culture of security completely ingrained enough to even succeed with the client. How do you ask them to go do what is necessary to be secure, which isn't just tools. I think you have to have the tools, but it is actually, you know, and Justin, I'm gonna steal his thunder because he gave me this earlier, but it really is the <laughs> management of data the privacy and security, the CIA triad of that and learning all that nomenclature. But at the end of the day, it's always been our duty to some extent. And I think that, you know, you kind of brought that up earlier, but um, yeah, I, I got a little tangential as I wanted to do, but I, I think it's, it's something that we have to get better inside our own hearts and do things. And there's no better way than to start looking at and thinking of your organization and saying, how would I attack me? I've got at least 10 things mm -hmm. I can't answer right now if someone attacked me. I know them. I live them. I hate them. I can't solve them sometimes, right? And I think the, the yeah. issue is that a lot of people are just starting that journey. Uh, Steve, I bet you've got a lot of yeah. experience with that, of helping people through that, understanding that security isn't just Ferrari parts, right? It, it's more yeah, to absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and I think that's a great point. Like, especially in the MSP community, you're dealing with everybody from, you know, the, the smallest business um, that's that's still trying to figure out how to um, work in the office and, and do that securely. Uh, and all of a sudden they're transformed into right. this uh, complete work from home or, you know, um, you know, completely detached from the customer, which from a business perspective is an incredibly difficult thing, right? Where you've got to wear a mask, you know, there's no smile, there's no, yeah. you know, and you're dealing with those kinds of things as a small business that doesn't have an IT person and absolutely doesn't have a security person. So you're dealing with those folks that, you know, on a security information security program maturity level or, you know, barely above a zero kind of a thing, if they're even thinking of it yeah. at all. And then you've got organizations. They're probably that, still in willful ignorance at that stage, right? Like, I, exactly. I don't mean that to be negative, or, but it's, it's, or purpose. even not willful ignorance, just like, sure, I don't even know what I don't even know at this yeah, point. Right? Um, and so I think, um, you know, from that perspective, and then all the way up into organizations that really have their stuff together, they've, They've at least got a plan. They have a, a security person, maybe a couple, um, yeah. and everything in between. So, to to uh, you know to answer JP's question from that perspective, I think um, building that culture is is the upfront thing. We you know in security mm -hmm. for a long time, we used to say that um, you know the user is the is the number one threat in my environment, which I I tend to agree with that. And the user is always bad. The user is terrible, that kind of thing. But the, the end user can be your biggest resource if you build a true culture of security in your MSP and trickle that down into your customer base um, where, where you can work through those, you know, end user type of issues um, and, and really find kind of this like a euphoric state of, hey, my, my end users are letting me know about security problems, security issues in my environment before all of these tools, all of these things that I've purchased before those can even let me know that things are happening. You hit the nail on the head. I sat through a talk um, uh, with this British woman that talked about how we focus on the wrong side of security. And I think you just said it, Steve, and that's awesome that we always talk about the failure, but how many times do they actually succeed at not clicking that phishing link that got through and not running that application or not? And, and we talk about the one failure and even in our phishing tests, we focus on, oh, this 20% clicked. Why not find some level of social proof exactly. and say, hey, this 80% succeeded in my test. And these right. 99 times you didn't let one slip. Thank you for reporting that incident. You get a lot more people reporting incidents. You get a lot more data than if you exactly. beat them with a stick when it happens, right? I yeah, mean, for sure. excellent point. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the negative consequence training, that's a great point, right? The hu we're human, and so we're tending to be, oh, I don't want to get in trouble, and, you know, and, and, and so I, I think that's a big thing. The human element was once 
viewed as in this negative light and from a security perspective, but bringing a positive approach to it to say, you know what, we're, 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 we may have our challenges, but we're also a critical piece of a good security situation, right? Because we are involved. And so, you know, and, and then to your point, Matt, it starts, you got to look within and look at yourself, right? You would, would be the change you want to see in the world, right? I mean, right. If, if you want your customers to be secure, you, you should start with yourself and your organization um, and, and, you know, focusing on kind of that key point, which is you, you mentioned earlier, Matt, data, right? Data, data is the, the single most important thing. And it's what the threat actors are after. Right. Yep. It's not it, it, it's it's not your, you know, uh, you know, the, the individual or, or some piece of, um, you know, tangible uh, hardware. It's it's they're after your data because that's where they see the value. Uh, and so, you know, that's ultimately what what we're trying to protect. And, um, you know, the the fact that um, the iterative iterative approach that you mentioned is is so important because, you know, tomorrow's a new day. Right. There's new threats. Things have changed. People's behavior has changed. Um, and, 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 you know, some people, they're having a bad day. So maybe they're not thinking as sharp. Right. So, you know, it could be that, 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 that they had a great day the day before, but but on Monday and Tuesday is not as good. And so so they're maybe more vulnerable to a security threat. And so you have to iterate and, and constantly be reevaluating what you are doing, because it is absolutely cannot be set it and forget it. Yeah, so what I just heard is we're human and humans make mistakes, fair enough, right? We can have a good day one, one day and a bad day the next, hence we slip. Um, but Matt and, and Steve both, you guys hit on something, and, and I'll call it the quote-unquote eating your own dog food. So if you start internally, it's an easier conversation to have with the end user, fair statement? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You understand it, right? If you've consumed it, if you've gone through it, like – my technicians probably hate me. We've, we've been on Azure Active Directly, Directory, Direct Bind for four and a half years, living in the Intune life and the bleeding edge of Microsoft where you sometimes get cut really deeply, right? And, and, and the, the reality is, is that if you go through the process of turning on conditional access policies and you know, everybody talks about security as cost, right? That's the same thing a client goes, well, how much more is this going to cost me? Time, attention, giving a crap. Mm. I've met with so many CEOs that, that could tell you the pressures in the hydraulic line on dump truck number seven when it leaves versus when it comes back and then says, oh, no, that IT security, that stuff's just for the smart folks. Really? Gotcha. No problem. What, what got you to this position in business? It didn't get you there mm -hmm. by ignoring huge swaths of risk, huge swaths of opportunity. And I think part of this is that having that conversation to get people more aware that this is a participant sport and it doesn't always cost something. To go in and set up a new conditional access policy in Azure or to set up a new DNS policy with your, your MSSP or, or tool provider or whatever it may be, those things may cost nothing extra. They may cause some headache. You have to fight through some hearts and minds, right? The biggest thing is that technician says, I'm going to quit. This is just too hard for me. You're making my job impossible. You're setting me on impossible parameters. And, um, and, and in, in some degrees, maybe there are some points where we have to get more efficient to make up for those differences and deliver security at the speed of business. But ultimately, you have to win that hearts and mind discussion iteratively, right? You have to do it little by little. You don't, you don't drop a frog in a boiling pot of water and it jumps out. You put them in and turn on yeah. the heat little by little, right? And, and I think that is already part of that iterative process is that since 1979, an epoch date, and before that, it's just convenient for me, right? Since epoch date, we've always believed in the business aspects of technology and not the security aspects of technology. Right now, you filter right. that down. SMBs ten to fifteen years behind corporations, and then we've only got a few ten to fifteen year iterations since then. Since technology's birth, you get into the situation where we are so broken. And back to Steve's point, I always tell people: there's what you know, what you don't know, what you don't know, you don't know. We have so much in security that's in the don't know, you don't know bucket, but our adversaries mm. don't. Right? They know it. They're exploiting it. It's easy. Um, but yeah, I. I Got off on tangent there as I'm one to do. No, nope. you're good. You're good. So let me ask this from a managed services perspective, and we got plenty of them on this video. I know one of the questions sure. that was posed to me prior to coming in here is, okay, Matt, I hear you. We eat, you know, we, we embrace the security posture internally. Now, how do I go position that to my end user? So I'm not selling a product, but I'm having a security conversation. 
So could you shed some light just from an MSP's perspective on like maybe some best practices, do's, don'ts? I mean, what would you advocate there? Well, I think this goes back to basics, right? In the sense that know thyself is first, right? And I I think Steve's already laughing about that, but it really does. If you would go sit down with a client and pretend you're you're now CEO, Jonathan, you you run JP, you you run Green Cloud, and I come up and say, okay, JP, what would happen? Yeah, the tie's got to be on, dude. We got to be a stickler until four thirty. But I would ask you, how could I take out your business, your data centers? How could I take out your business in twenty four to forty eight hours? Right. Mm. If I ask that question and we start going down the path of Oh, well, my dump trucks aren't running. It's a data center with dump trucks. I don't know if you've heard of those, but it's new. But the, if my dump trucks aren't running. I'm not making money, right? And, and you start now saying, okay, JP, what makes your dump trucks not run? Well, gasoline, sure. Okay, what about, you know, mm. scheduling? Yep. What about maintenance? Sure, you got a shop, you got maintenance. What, what about the technology? Oh, yeah. Yeah, boy, if that email system went down or if I couldn't track my trucks and if I couldn't get the concrete lined up so it doesn't harden, this is real stories. I mean, I've been through this with, with clients, mm-hmm. right? Well, I'd be, I'd be down. Great. What components go into that? Well, smart people handle that. Well, humor me. Let's have a conversation. You got the server. You got the cloud delivery. You have the identity of those aspects. What would happen if we were down for these things in that way? And, and how do we have to adjust? It's having the conversations, JP. It's just simply asking the questions about it. And it's called a business impact analysis, right? It's a, Mm -hmm. let's look at this tool and that tool. If you as an MSP listed every tool you use to deliver service to your clients, mine was huge. It blew my mind. I sat down with four other MSPs and we just spitballed for an hour. And we came up with lists that were arms long of stuff that I would use to abuse me. I would use to attack me. And And I don't want to create fear, uncertainty and doubt. It's just data. You don't go to a football game and not have watched any game film of the team you're playing. If you have, you aren't planning on winning straight up. And so the, the point is, is that, you know, we, we get back to this. We have to know ourselves because if you don't know what you're protecting, you're not protecting. It's not just any virus. It's not just a DNS protection. It's not just SAML. It's just, you have to know it and protect it just like you would a physical asset. My dump truck has a lot of things. They lock it. They take the keys out. They put it somewhere where it's high visibility. They have lights. They even swing the generators up on poles from the crane so nobody steals them. And yet, no 2FA. No 2FA. Hmm. (laughs) You don't lock the door? Anyways, I'll get off my rant. Yeah, I think, you know, I kind of want to second what Matt's saying in that, you know, the the CIS top six security controls, which which they say if you handle these these top six security controls, then you've solved something like 84 to 87%. It may be higher now. I don't know what they're claiming with this, but... Um, you know, a, a significant amount of your risk is lowered if you just implement these six security controls. And the first two are knowing your environment. It's your hardware inventory and your software inventory. That's, yep. that's bottom line. If you don't know what you have to protect, then you don't know how to protect it. Um, and, and it does really get down to the basics. That is your foundational level of security um, that you have to build your entire security house on. And, and to Matt's point, you do that you know, from, from the concrete foundation that these concrete trucks and dump trucks are preparing. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate uh, you carrying that imagery forward. They, uh, you know, it, it, these first two, knowing your environment and having visibility into what, number three is establishing essentially vulnerability management, right? And understanding the threats in your environment, right? You don't, you cannot possibly um, take a look at your vulnerabilities and, and know what those are if you don't know what the assets are. Not even, yeah. not even close. I want to make this. God, there, I was just going to say, just real quick for for the sales personalities on here. I want you, I want, I want you to make sure you're picking up what Matt was throwing down. Business impact analysis for the sales personalities. It's asking the right questions to your client, right? Asking what keeps them up at night, right? Ensuring that you understand what it is you're talking about. That's critical and key, right? And I would imagine. If you're a salesperson, make sure that you have somebody along beside you as you ask those same questions to the end user that has maybe a couple extra letters behind their name. It's good street cred right there, right, Matt? Am I wrong about that? Not, it's not a bad thing, but <laughs> um, ultimately, though, I think what you're getting at is that you need to ask the right questions. You need to have done your due care. You need to think about those things. And I think to bring it all the way back, if you do those things for yourself, if you sit down 
you find the technician inside that you've always told to be quiet because they go, that's not secure. We should do this in a better way. And listen, bring them in, help build that culture and do a BIA. Sit down and talk about what happens if lab tech goes down. What happens if automated mm. is down? What happens if my central identity authority goes down? What happens if, and just do the what happens ifs. Just do that. Go through each tool and do the what happens if. And what you should do is sort those by timelines you can live with it, right? Right, we've all been in those bad situations where you can live with it for five minutes or you can live with it for days or you can live with it for months. And I think if you start doing that, what you're saying is I can have Screen Connect maybe be down for a day and be in trouble. But if my PSA was down, I'm in trouble right now. Right. And, and so there's those type of categorizations. And guess what you've done? You've started building your return time objectives, you know, your restore time objectives, your restore point objectives of how far back you have to go, what tools I should put in to protect it. We assign a security score to it. People have to have a certain score to access things above a certain level. Um, you know, and you can start just being creative, but you can't do that if you don't know yourself, right? If you don't know that I'm going to be working with Play-Doh and I'm going to be working with sticks and you come prepared for ice, you're not going to be well set to build something with that, right? And I mm. think the, the point is, is that know yourself first, to just 100%. And then everything beyond that becomes muscle memory for how you do that with your client. Because their environments won't be near as complex as ours in general. I mean, that's not necessarily true, but compared to what we have to do to deliver service compared to probably the bell curve of most clients in that under 100 user space, we, we probably need to know ourselves a lot more than they do. But in the same breath, I think we can help them get to a bell curve. You know, as Steve said, those first six, let's get them in place. Let's do the basics. Let's have the conversations. But if you feel like you're always selling to them, you've already failed. This has to be prescriptive, right? right? I, I think people have heard this from me before, but my doctor doesn't kind of step out and go, man, I've had a bad revenue quarter. I don't want Matt to leave me. I like his revenue. And I know he's got high blood pressure and he's fat, but let's only talk about the blood pressure <laughs> today because I don't want to make him mad. No, it doesn't happen. The doctor comes in and is prescriptive. They understand their material. They know empirically that humans die if their blood pressure is over a certain amount for a, a long period of time. They understand the ways they pass away. They understand empirically that you should take this blood pressure medicine because if you don't, the greater good is not done and you will probably pass away. Additionally, you should mm. change some lifestyle benefits. This is so correlative, right? Because that doctor says, don't eat that bad stuff. Don't do that. Maybe don't let your people bring their own devices from home that are Apple OS from 22 years ago or, right? And maybe I'm a little long on that. But the point being is I, I think we don't believe it. And, and as MSPs, we don't. And I think that's yeah. where partnering with experts and partnering with people that have built these security operations helps them show you, teach you, and make sure you understand what you're doing for your clients in a way that helps you be more confident too. So Steve, you look um, like, yes. Yep. Yeah, I just, I, apparently I'm just going to co-sign on every uh, metaphor you use. I'm all right with that. I got a bunch um, of them. <laughs> but, but when you go into that same doctor and, and he decides that he wants to tell you about all of the things that are wrong with you, um, he's not going to say you need to fix all of these today. And he's not going to say you've got to, you know, in, in U.S. healthcare, let's call it, 1.5 million in in <laughs> in doctor's yeah. bills coming right today yeah true um, Not Tylenol. yeah exactly <laughs> um, but but what he's going to do is he's going to say hey you know you have high blood pressure what's your diet look like let's let's sit down and discuss how we can take a a slow approach to get it correct and to get it right and um, they build out this roadmap. They build out just a, a plan, right? And that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to. You cannot approach security without a plan. Um, right. Now it goes back to the kind of that ignorance, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so that's where we come in as MSPs, as MSSPs doing this for a long time, you help them to build that roadmap based on their, their business processes, based on what industry they're in based on today's current th current threats and prioritization of vulnerabilities of security risks etc cetera, etc cetera. but but you know that doctor isn't going to say all right next thursday we have you scheduled for knee surgery heart surgery hip surgery oh, uh, we're right gonna, we're going to give you a colonoscopy uh you know all <laughs> of these things right that's not how it happens it, it's right. take take some small steps let's see if a few of these you know 
reduced to some degree to a point where you are comfortable saying, I accept the risk of this in my environment, in my body. And, and then you go forward and, and you have a, you know, you, you get to live on beyond, um, you know, that, that short term that maybe, maybe on day one, it looked really bleak. You know, you had that three to six month range to live, but by the time you're, you're processing through this roadmap and you're, you're iterating, as we all keep saying, you're there, right? You're in a better position today than you were yesterday. And tomorrow is, is a hell of a lot better than it was. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and, well, and I, I, I was just going to say, and I would think too, Steve. I mean, if if, if I'm a customer of, of yours, you know, the the managed services company, and I'm 25 people, and that customer has now grown from 25 people to 50, 50 to 100, based on growth, acquisition, whatever we want to call it, our risks are greater. What we have to lose is that much greater. So, from a security posturing standpoint, we should be having these conversations with confidence leading the client, looking at their end goals in mind, right? What keeps them up at night and marching them backwards? I mean, fair statement? Yeah, yeah I'm, I, go ahead, go ahead. Well, well, you touched a nerve on something because you, you, you actually said the word twice, Justin, Steve said it once, but the quantification of what we do next with business impact analysis is really a risk calculation, right? It's a risk, mm-hmm. we are talking about risk and, you glossed over it, but I want to focus on that a sec, because ultimately, once we have the acceptance and understanding of risk through cyber, once we get it, and by we, I mean me and the client, right? And, and we get that there is an actual risk and that there's opportunity. Let's not lose that. We can't just talk about the risk. We have to say, how do I make your client's clients better? How's their experience better because of your technology? But that aside, when we talk about risk, we can make decisions. We can ignore the risk as we're doing today. We can quantify the risk and ensure the risk as we should be doing, right? And finding ways to adequately do that. And we can do things to mitigate the risk. And when you combine the second and the third option, not the first, you you don't want to combine the ignorance, but the the second and the third option of of defining the risk and kind of doing things to quantify and, and offset and then also to fix some of those things, that leftover is your risk remainder, right? There's a lot of different ways that can be said, but ultimately that's what you've decided to say, I'll carry this risk. It doesn't mean the action is going to happen. It doesn't mean that the bad guy is going to get the right email to the right place at the right time, but it does mean that you have chosen what you're willing to carry. If every customer would do that level, that's it. If they would just simply look mm-hmm. at that, the data is so large that they would start taking iterative action, period. They, they do it with their place. Like how many bosses go, did you lock the back door? By golly, I'll fire you for it. But no problem. Write your password on the keyboard so that Matt can come by and snag it with his left eye as he walks by. Right? Like those things are so stupid. It doesn't even make sense. And it proves that companies, businesses, SMB in general have not accepted and understood that they mm. need to treat this as risk just like fire. And, and, and I'll bring right you another metaphor, right? Because every time... Every human knows they don't want fire. It doesn't take much. It's fairly built in. Animals get it too, right? They see that fire and they kind of don't like it. But once you've burned your hand on the stove, whoa, son, I promise you, you're not going to touch fire again. You don't like it, right? You've learned from that. The, the yeah. difference is that in business, we even see people that, that understand that they buy insurance against fire in their business, mm. largely for their own loan reasons. And also they believe in fire, but they don't play kickball with lanterns lit in there as goalposts, right? They, they don't light fires inside their building because they believe in it and they understand the impact of a fire in their building, even with insurance, still not good. Operations are impacted, ability to deliver service impacted, period. Yet with cyber, they choose to pretend like they cannot see it. And it's our job to tell that story, not through fear, but through quantification to say, what can you afford to be down? Let me unplug this server and you tell me how long you're down. Great. Now we're having a DR conversation, aren't we? Well, I just can't afford that. I understand. Then at least accept the risk and don't try to pretend it's not what it is, right? You've chosen to have no ability to restore from backup quickly. You've chosen not to have access points or outside of your operational facilities. They will cost you X in the following ways if this happens. And if you don't know it, go learn it. There's lots of resources. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, so let, let's do this. I'm going to pivot to uh, a question that someone asked of me and Matt who couldn't be here today for the call. Great guy out of Washington, D.C. Jim Turner asked this question to us last night. And as I ask this, Matt, I'm going to ask you to 
to give us your two cents. And then for everybody on video, I'm going to throw up a couple polls. It's just two questions. Please take the time to answer them. But here's the question. Uh, so Jim asked, and, and think of yourself as a managed services business owner, right? And you have an employee, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this so I don't mess it up. And the employee manages your remote monitoring tool sets and has access to anything and everyone on your team. Well, that employee was overseas and was kidnapped, right? Um, and he also, that person also has access to all of your clients' networks. He also asked me if this scenario is too dark for me to improvise, but I'm not improvising, not for Jim. I mean, he would appreciate that. So, you know, in theory, what would you do and how would you ask? How would you answer to the call on something like that, Matt? Because, I mean, that is a, that's a, that's a, hopefully that wouldn't happen to anybody. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a dark world, right? So let's talk about security and what the impact can be. What I, what I mean by that is if you're smart, you have started to think about these things ahead of time and started to limit people to the privilege that they need, right? The least privilege uh, and the role-based access and things. One of the, my key tenants is if my person in, I always beat up on Dallas. I don't want to beat up on Dallas no more. We're going to use Rochester. If my person in Rochester gets compromised, when, when they get compromised, right? Even through all of my mm. efforts and all the things I do, I want the eight people that that person was responsible for, the eight clients or 25 or 17 or 14 or whatever it is to be the ones suing me. That's it. I want that lawsuit to encompass seven and I can insure against seven, right? The challenge is, is that all too often we're provided with tool sets that don't let, allow us to say, hey, Justin only needs to touch these 12 clients. Let's set up a group that's just in team alpha group. And let's make it so that even in the RMM, with all the power they have, they only have requisite power over X, right? And, and I think that is some of the conversation is those are free. Oftentimes those cost nothing. Back to Steve's point earlier that we had, you know, really moved me in when I met him first about why I thought this was a great acquisition, but it is that a lot of these things are not money. We've tried to revenue all these things, but they're really just good decisions and the choice to look at something with lenses and an intent to understand and make a decision on how to protect myself just like you would not getting punched in the face by the bully at schoolyard. You make a choice to go around or you, you know, kick him in the <laughs> knee. But either way, you make decisions. We have this weird gap where because technology is this black box, everybody gets a pass on ignoring all the positives and all the risks. We get to entertain mm. all the positives and see profitability, but not deal with and account for the risk. And that will catch up, right? It does every day. So, so so speaking of risk, so, I mean, I, people, there, there's a ton of people, there's like over 180 people that have chimed in on the polls. The, the two questions were, do you, do you know of anybody that's, uh, you know, been hit by ransomware? The, the vast majority have answered yes. And then, of course, um, what is your main top concern, security concern, excuse me. So number one was data protection, right? And then a, right behind that was email security. Go figure, right? Um, it looks like behind that was endpoint, and then and then after that was uh, remote work, if you will. So from uh, data protection, and since that was number one, I mean, let's just chime in on that real quick. Uh, and Steve, let me let me start with you on this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it it comes down to the same thing Matt was discussing in the in the instance of, um, <clears throat> you know, one of my employees is compromised in in some sort of compromised situation, whatever that might be. Right. Um, and, and, but I've, but I've developed the principle of least privilege. I've developed, um, my, my role-based access control. I've, you know, I've got all of those pieces in place, right? The, the same thing goes for the protection of data. Um, mm. and, and also, you know, I, I, I hate to just beat the dead horse of let's go back and talk about that foundation, but I always do it. Knowing your environment, knowing what you have is the first step in data protection. Um, it's not just that hardware and software inventory, although hardware or software inventory encompasses the data protection piece, right? But, but knowing what kind of data I have, what classification of data that is, you know, what are, what are truly the gems in my treasure chest, right? right. And, and what's just data? What's, you know, Tom and Sales uh, golf pick from last Saturday compared to proprietary information that, that's sitting in, in data? stores, right? Um, and, and understanding my level of risk that's associated with that, with those pieces of data and those specific classifications and how I'm going to protect those. Um, recovery time objectives, how long can I live without it, right? Recovery point objectives, 
how far back, you know, if, if I have data streaming in from a, from a application or something every five seconds, and I can live with about 30 seconds of lost data, there's my recovery point objective. I, I have to mm. go back within the last 30 seconds and understand what that looks like, right? So being able to protect that starts at a baseline of knowing what you have. And, and I always beat this, you know, for the, for the very few folks on here that have seen me talk before, they know that I beat this like a drum, like a dead horse. Um, I just beat on this foundational thing of know what you have because so many people gloss over this one fact they want to just throw products. They want to just throw services at a problem. You cannot do that. And, and I've, I've said this in a couple of green cloud webinars already. Um, garbage in, garbage out. If you, if you have garbage data coming in, you can't protect it. You, you're going to have garbage out output. Um, and the same thing goes here. If I just throw blanket security policies, blanket data protection policies at my data that, that just covers, A, it's going to be expensive expensive. You're going to be writing that same US, US healthcare kind of a doctor's bill, right? Um, if, if I know my data and I'm classifying it appropriately and I say Tom's golf picks don't necessarily need the same RPO as my data that's coming out of my business critical application, uh, you know, that's going to be a lot cheaper for me. And, and I'm going to protect that a, a lot more closely in and in a, in a much more deliberate manner than I would maybe, you know, file shares or, or something that is just kind of benign to the business. Yeah, and it's interesting too, o over the years, I, I have an MSP background. So before I came to GreenCloud, I, I worked for MSPs for a number of years. And, and the data protection backup and DR conversation is something that I would say that MSPs are relatively comfortable having because they've been doing it for years. All the while, not really, I don't think, fully grasping that, that that is part and parcel to the security conversation, because ultimately that is what your security posture is, is put together to do is to protect your data. So while it's just a piece of that security um, posture and that security solution or, 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 or art, you know, solution, excuse me, that you're putting together, um, data protection is at its core. And so how do we get that comfort level that MSPs have about talking about data protection into the security conversation. I mean, you know, Matt, I'll turn that to you. I think it's the, that there's no delineability. I mean, I think the point that you made is, is eloquently put that the data is the security. I, if I don't have any data, if I never collect a single social security, if I let you call yourself Justin the man, if I did, if I did all those things and did business with you, I don't give a crap if I'm breached in some ways, right? Like there's no impact to you or me in, in a lot of ways, but you now paint the picture of Steve's intellectual property. You now paint the picture of ITAR or this bits industrial based space. You start painting some of these other compliance like healthcare spaces, then, then the breach itself is the risk and having a well-crafted data protection policy, starting a backup, but also then extending to, maybe I won't put any healthcare information on these 19 servers that are core to my function. So that that way I only have to maintain a different restore point objective a different security tool sets, a different type of egress logs to look at if I do have a problem, just a much different environment. And so how do you have the conversation? You start from the data, you start from what it's used for in the categorization. I think those are, are brilliant conversations for sure. And then you just start extending that into the ways the data gets lost. I'll give you a really cheap freebie that I do. I go buy my domain on Dropbox. I'm not gonna implement it. I pay $29 license for, for a single enterprise, I put in SSO and I set a setting that says, if you have an iconic address, you can't start a Dropbox account. I just ruled out what would have cost me an entire CASB to do. Don't get me wrong, I'm being super <clears throat> summative. There's other attack ways. But the point being is start thinking like a threat actor. And I won't say hacker, because I'm a hacker, but a threat actor. Start trying to look at and learn the ways. If you haven't used tryhackme.com to train your people, just on the security <clears throat> and technical work like it teaches them you know the network and but it's gamifying how you learn those tactical technical operational aspects once you do that you can go oh i'll steal your oauth token what keeps me up at that night wasn't anything on your list it was someone harvesting an oauth token from me and using that in a way that they are me through all of my controls right um i think solar gate or solar gate but um anyways go ahead steve yeah no yeah hey I love it. I mean, I think that's great. Go, go, go ahead, Steve. I mean, I was just going to say one of the questions was like, how, how do we be in? I think thinking differently, right? I mean, that was big. Steve, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
we talked about it before the before the webinar began. Like we've been in this a while. <laughs> we are gonna let things slip. Like yeah, you being right. worried about your OAuth token after a certain period, you're like, I've got a lot of protections in place, and you have one of those days. Maybe I woke up and I didn't get coffee. Maybe I didn't get my <laughs> QT cup. Right? Yeah, gotta have the QT. Maybe it's cup. not full of Red Bull. Um, you know those kinds of things. Um, we're gonna drop the ball. Um, and, and I hate to do this because this is the point where you're going to go, oh, well, Steve's a hypocrite. He just said, you know, this, and, and now he's saying that. What happens, what happens when, um, you know, that employee does click on something? What happens when I have a bad day and I forget to do X, Y, and Z as part of my normal security posture that, it, that I've built a culture of, of security, but I'm just off today. Like I woke up on the wrong side of the bed and things are not going well. Um, what happens? Um, it it does turn around and come back to those tools and protections that you have in place, right? right? So mm -hmm. so as much as I want to say it's not necessarily about the tool, it's not necessarily about you know spending a whole lot, bunch of money. Um, yeah. Ultimately, in that iterative process, you're coming back around to say, all right, if it does happen, yep. can can I um, from a from a place um, of of uh, calm and serenity sit back yeah. and say, I have the visibility into my environment that I need because I know mm -hmm. my environment. I have all of the assets and, and resources and capabilities in place that I can sit back and, and take some calm approach to reacting and responding and that kind of thing, right? right? <clears throat> and, and um, you know, inevitably you're going to have one of those bad days. Something bad is gonna happen in your environment and it, it, you have to be able to come back from that. And, you know, there, there was for years, it was this whole idea of it's not if a hack is going to happen, it's when, and that's all everybody said, but nobody really filled in the back end of that is, is that, you know, build, build that worst case scenario in your head and, and understand what that looks like. So you can have a, an extremely reduced mean time to respond. Um, and, you know, you're not having Iran living in your environment for, you know, and an extended period of time, these, uh, you know, um, yeah. persistent threats. The dwell time, yeah, yeah. ABT. The dwell time is, is much lower if you can if you can do that. So it's just kind of a tangent that I picked up while you were talking, but it's extremely important to understand that that iterative process comes right back around and calls you a hypocrite for everything you've been preaching. No, no, and and I think I think you're hundred percent correct. I think in the same way, you don't fault the doctor when he goes. Hey, we're going to give you this verset before we put you on the operating table, and then we're going to knock you out for good. And, no, man, I'm going to go back to the hammer. Can you get me the hammer? I really like a hammer in the head. That's my favorite method. No, and I think that's the point: is that we have to be iterative. And and you know, I, I make this statement of you know, a box of Ferrari parts doesn't make a Ferrari. You have to have a shop. You have to have the the mechanics that are willing to put it together. You probably have to have the auspices of Ferrari for a lot of the things you might need mechanically and electrically and, and computer wise. But ultimately, you still have to have all those parts in order to put it together. All the experience in the world, all the mechanics and all the sign off in the world doesn't put them together if you don't have parts. And so I, I think what this is about is knowing what parts you need, knowing where your data is, so you can put the appropriate parts in the appropriate place and being partnered with the right professionals to help you grow those mm. capabilities and stretch. Like, you know, Jonathan, like your JP, you said, hey, uh, by the way, if you change it to JP on there, I wouldn't be as dumb with the whole reading Jonathan. Uh, it's all good. Um, but, you know, if, if uh, oh man, I got lost in my head. You were going somewhere. Where were you going? I don't know. I lost her. It's unfortunate. Hey, what, what I will say, let, let, let's do this in the spirit of time as we're running up on, um, I guess, towards the end of, I guess, the allotment. One thing that did come in, and, and it speaks to the evolution of our discussion. And this discussion that you're having with clients and users, uh, it is an evolution discussion. But the one question that came in that I think we should address, and it's for obvious reasons of what we're living in now, is how has the pandemic um, impacted, obviously, the security conversation? I mean, working from home is an easy one. But um, Matt, you go first, and Steve, fire back, and, and just give us some thoughts there. Well, I tell you, like a kid in the candy store. And the reason I say that is we have all been stuck in this forced experiment, right? Where we're all working from home. We're taking technologies that we're either meant to or we're not meant to. Think of the difference between somebody in a VDA running in green cloud 
versus somebody that has to deal with 100 meg bandwidth by 20 up that they're VPN in into their office now that they're all outside of it, right? What a delineation that is. Um, and and I, I think that because we've been forced into this experiment, there's marketing opportunities, right? How many times can you go and have a 100% land rate on the thing you're marketing, right? I can speak towards what your poor experience was like with your technology. I can speak towards what your good experience was like and what your competitor's good experience was like. I have a huge universal marketing platform to talk to people about technology. Added to that, somebody proffered that it was like eight months to a month, right? Of, of growth and technology and a need and infrastructure and, and all of those deliverables. And, and we spent a year at it. So we're eight or nine years, I'm not smart with math, but we're eight or nine years or so into technology advancement, right? And I, and I think all of these are coming together at a time where we're racing towards platform services, software service, software as a service models that, that go away from that infrastructure world and now have 12 variables instead of 700, which means we can script security we can make classifications that go across multiple systems. We can start doing those things in a much more efficacious way. So I think you have this combination of the right ear, the right experience, the right mm -hmm. thing to talk about what's next, and an upswing in our economy. Like, I, I don't know about you, but if you can't sell in that, you probably have to do something different for a living, right? Amen, brother. Amen. Yeah. Steve, what's your thought? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I just kind of, um, I, I agree with Matt. It, it's a ton of opportunity for the MSP, right? It's a ton of opportunity for all of us in this industry. Um, for those small business owners, excellent. That's great. <clears throat> for those it's all about an evolution. Owners, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, fine. I'll go to my Kyle shot. That's good. There yeah, you go. go. <laughs> awesome, man. Uh, for those small I didn't mean business to mess owners, you up, Steve. It's, a, it's a complete uproot of everything they've everything they've been working towards, everything they've built in the past eight or nine years, to Matt's point, of, of technological advancement, it's a complete uproot of that. They've spent all of this time, money, and effort on all of this infrastructure to support what they have in place today. Um, and, and to move that yeah. out, now, you know, let's say they were in a good position where they knew everything about their environment. Now they have to understand an entirely new environment, an, entire, an entirely different work culture as well, because, you know, what, what used to look like normal traffic in 2019 was mm. between, between eight and five, Tom from sales, when he isn't on his golf trip, is accessing these resources from this period of time, right? But now, yep. Tom from sales and his wife have to teach their three kids math and English and history and all of these mm. things, right? They have to... Um, figure out how to get their groceries delivered they have to um not do sports so they're drinking a lot because their kids aren't out of the house <laughs> right real talk <laughs> and and so by the real. time by the time tom from sales can finally sit down and do his email he's accessing all of those, those resources from nine o'clock p.m to midnight instead of that eight to five there's an entirely new um just business process that has completely impacted security and if they were one of those organizations that really understood their user base and all of the ways that they use technology now it's completely flip-flopped it's a completely different thing and they've got to change that so there's a there's a lot of opportunity a, a lot of opportunity as i stutter through this to to the msp um there's a lot of challenges on the business side alone, as well as technology that, that these folks have had to overcome. And there's obviously there's technology to, to deal with this. Um, but, but having the ability to completely change your business um, as well as invest in people and, and um, processes to deal with this new reality was, was difficult. And I hate saying that new reality and, and all of that, but um I mean, but that's, that's the truth, that's right? I mean, that's absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, 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 like I said, I mean, we were winding up on the end of this, but um, for everybody, all four of you guys and everybody that joined, thank you. Someone did ask if this was going to be recorded. I don't know what everybody saw that or not. It is recorded. It will be available. Um, Matt, thank you a ton for jumping on, lending your two cents. That was awesome. And uh, – for Steve and Justin, thanks so much. 
And for everybody in the partner community, we appreciate each and every one of you. Have a fantastic afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. Bye, guys.